welcome to Sundays with Rev. Carla. This is a community like no other because it's church like no other. And I hope this is, I think we're in our second month, ending our second month together. And I hope you have found this a safe and sacred space and it has helped you feel the void of some of what you have lost from your spiritual community after leaving church or in your deconstructing journey. And it's at this point where I invite you, if you are willing and are able to take a deep breath with me, inhale and exhale, and I will offer a prayer. May our hearts be open to receive, may our minds be open to learn, and may our souls be willing to connect to the sacred and to each other. Okay, so let's get started. The teaching theme for this week is called Honoring What Was, and this is about grief. So we are just on the edge of the month of November, and this is the time where we're going to be entering into the whole season of the holidays. And right after November comes, November, um, the first of November, you'll have two holidays that originated in Catholic, Catholic tradition, which is All Saints Day and All Souls Day. So All Saints Day uh, honors patron saints and All Souls Day is there to honor the passing of loved ones. Now, of course, there'll be people who say that Pope Gregory did not intentionally set these for November, but All Saints Day was moved from May to the 1st of November because what happens at the end of October, which is Samhain, which is uh, basically a celebration of the Day of the Dead and Hallow's Eve. And if, if All Saints Day and All Souls Day are mandated attendance in the Catholic tradition, well, what can you not do? Well, you can't go out and party like rock stars all night, right? So I tend to lean, lean towards the fact that I do believe these were strategically placed because there was a lot of tradition and ritual around Samhain. But what I really want to talk about here is the portal to the holiday season, because we know this can be a very challenging time, especially for those of us who hold grief around and, and remembering that, um, that things are going to be different, even if the loss has been from several years ago. And one cue for us is when we start to dread the holidays. Now I have talked a little bit and I will, I've talked about sacred boundaries and the importance of that. And that can make the, the, the holidays challenging for those who are still here. But when we're dreading the holidays, it's actually a signal to us that something is off. It means when we're dreading anything, it means that we are not facing a situation with clarity and tension and presence. So we're going to talk a little bit about what it means to dread the holidays because of, of grief and sorrow. And of course, we're going to do it through our indoctrinated experiences, because at least for me, and I know for many of you, grief and sorrow were one of the human experiences, just like redemption and forgiveness and gratitude that was weaponized. So it was often downplayed about an individual's grief because we were instructed to emphasize the importance of focusing on the salvation of the depart departed loved one. So don't be shy or don't be sad. They're in heaven. Don't cry. They're with Jesus. Celebrate. I remember one of my former pastors telling the story of being at the bedside of a woman who was holding vigil for her husband who was, who was dying. And when he took his last breath, she took off running up and down the uh, hospital corridor, laughing and singing and praising Jesus because he was finally with Jesus. And he told that story to everybody. And you, this, the, the message is very clear that this is the standard by which we are all being measured about how we are handling grief. This is the way he expects us to act towards grief. Another reason why this is often 
uh, weaponized in this way is because if you give light to anything in your life, including your sorrow, you lose focus on the needs of the church. So this is very much another control mechanism of a high control Christianity. I don't know how many evangelical fundamentalist uh, sermons that I set through, which were supposed to be funeral services. I remember in high school where I had two high, high school friends who were 15 and 16 years old, who died horrifically in a car wreck. And the minister from the local Christian church did the dual funeral and never mentioned their names. He preached a sermon and at the end said that it was important that these moments were important to remember that no one is guaranteed tomorrow and that and people better get right with Jesus. And I think he was really disappointed that no one came up for the call for salvation in the middle of a funeral. Uh, my, I remember being enraged and I was only 16 years old. And I remember thinking if I ever get the opportunity to hold space for a funeral, I will never do that to another human being. I should have known then that I was foretelling my future because I know I do funerals really well because I acknowledge the pain and try to give hope where I can. But that really, really stuck with me that that is what they do. They prioritize evangelicalism over the and urgency of, of, of salvation over the needs of the grieving. So that is, that's part of what we need to de deconstruct from and why so many of us are horrible, horrible at holding space for the grieving. We're absolutely just horrible. And I know, let's just go through a quick punch list here. Tell me if any of these sound familiar to you. I'm sure they've been said to you or embarrassingly enough, perhaps you have said them because I know there was one in here that I had said before. Uh, the first one, at least they're not suffering anymore. Sure. That can be something that can be that the, that the grieving can say, but when it's offered in that kind of way, we have to be careful that we're not supplanting our perspectives over someone else's uh, grief process. At least they're in heaven now. Again, as if that's going to comfort them when all that person wants is their loved one back with them. Um, oh, wow. Are, aren't you done being sad? I, oh, I didn't expect you to be so sad after all this time. Mm -hmm. These are actual things that people have said to other people. Well, everything happens for a reason. You'll just have to wait and see how, what the blessing is going to come from this. And you really need to be strong for others. I know that's really hard for you, but other people are grieving too. And you know, don't be sad. They wouldn't want you to be sad. So let's put some guilt on as if you are the keeper of the departed's value system and you can say exactly what they would want. Well, just be grateful for the time you had and you just need to move on. Hmm. Yeah. Now I've seen this, especially on social media where people, people will post about their loss and they don't share what happened, which is very common. They just need to be seen, but they're not going to go through the story and people post what happened. If they wanted to tell us, they would, we're not in their immediate circle. They're just asking for love to be sent their way. And people who think that that's okay to do as if they have the right to ask that question. And of, oftentimes it's a reflection of our own vulnerability because what most people are asking is, is this something that could possibly take me or one of my loved ones away? What happened? Because I'm scared of my own vulner vulnerability. It'll be okay. It'll be okay. That's another comment that sometimes is made that is, has, is not rooted in any kind of comforting for the grieving at all. The other thing, and I want to be really careful here because I know so many of us 
it's very tempting to do this. And unless we're invited to, we have to be very careful about how we share our stories. But how often does someone share their grief story that someone tells in the comments or you've st stood be somebody, beside somebody as they tell their grief story? Well, when my mom died, oh yeah, I remember that. When my aunt died, I did this, I did this. And sometimes... They don't need to hear anything. They just need to know that we care. They just need, they don't need to know this is God's will. They don't care about God's will. They want to be just in a space where no words are going to be able to touch. No light is going to be able to get into that pain right now. They just need to be seen where no words are needed, but somehow we don't know how to show up in silence. So we try to find something to appease that. When I'm so very sorry, I have no words for you right now. I just want you to know that I'm here. Now, if you find yourself coming up on these holidays and you're feeling that dread arising, first of all, I want to invite you to give yourself some space. And it is okay to say to people, and this is where I think sometimes we try to force down because of those indoctrinated beliefs, we try to force down the grief that we're feeling and think, oh, I'll just get through it. I'll fake it where it, it needs to be okay for you to say sorrow is arriving for me right now. And it is really heavy. So I'm just going to need some space and please excuse me if during meetings or at family gatherings, I'm not going to be able to have small talk. And you say that ahead of time. And, and you can also say, and please, I don't need any words of comfort right now. I just need to acknowledge my grief. I want to come, but I just need to acknowledge my grief. And I don't need any words from anybody else. Just let me show up and let me have space for my grief. And this is how we can also, this goes back to our inner circle, because those in our inner circle should be the people who would know how to hold the space for us. So don't be afraid to give yourself permission to feel and acknowledge your sorrow without judgment or pressure to quickly, to quickly move away. There is a book written by Ab Abigail Thomas called three dog night. And in it, it's a memoir of her life and accounting her journey through grief and loss. And what this focuses on is her experiences after the death of her husband. And it shows how she struggled with the emotions and struggles and the, and the process of re trying to rebuild her life. And it dives into her exploration of holding space for the grief, the love that she still shared, and the complexities of moving forward while still honoring the past. So this is a good book that you might want to to look at if that is something that resonates with you the title three dog night actually refers it, it originated with the indig indigenous australians and what this is on a particularly cold night where it's necessary to sleep with three dogs to keep warm so think you know igloo out with your huskies or whatever so the phrase was popularized in the United States because of the, a rock band, but people really didn't understand that. Yes, it's recognized as a rock band who I loved by the way, but what it really is about is so the, the three dog nights related to its origin was about keeping you warm at night. And in her way, it's how she cuddled with her three dogs at night for comfort and solace. So I'll leave you with these questions. Where's your comfort? Where are your three dogs or rather who are your three dogs? Who is in your inner circle that you can trust to hold that space? What space do you need to get through these holidays and try to find meaning and connection without denying what's arising for you, for you to honor what was? The quote from Rumi for our time together is this, the wound is the place where the light enters you. Blessed be and amen. 
Now, beautiful souls, remember to nourish your spirit, nurture your dreams, and always believe in the incredible power that resides within you. Believe in miracles because you are indeed one. Until we meet again, may your path be filled with love, joy, and boundless opportunities. And if you are willing to come into this space with me, let's take a deep breath together and exhale. And I'll offer this closing prayer. Holy One, Divine Mystery, Sacred God, Universal Love, you who are known by so many names, yet none fully capture the wonder, the mystery, the love of all that you are. We say thank you for another day and for our time together. Now, if it feels right in this moment, spend time listening to my Spotify channel. And if you are closing out these Sunday gatherings with the journal, spend time processing what today's teaching is asking of you. What needs light? What needs healing? And may the rest of your day be gentle and be just what you need. I'll see you soon.